I found myself in a situation where I was almost uh, bankrupt and I needed to take my core competency, which is Hong Kong immigration, and turn it into something um, profitable. So um, my presentation is 15 minutes long, but it encompasses five years of experience, and I'll be disclosing and sharing uh, information with you tonight that I haven't shared anywhere else previously, even though I publish a great deal on our websites. So my proposition essentially is that um, you can create a monopoly in your space <coughs> by giving away all of your intellectual property away for free. So my argument tonight is that you can build that monopoly by being generous. So this generosity principle has got six points to it. So I'm going to race through these six points and uh, hopefully you'll, uh, you'll get value out of it. <coughs> Firstly, it's based on the law of reciprocity. Secondly, people misunderstand how the modern internet works. I'm going to uh, suggest to you that social media is a process. I'm also going to suggest to you that in the process of being generous, you're going to create a tribe. And when you've created that tribe, you'll be able to lead that tribe. I'm also going to suggest to you that in the connection economy that we have today, not, a connect, not an industrial economy, which is where we've come from, that you can re-aggregate, you can disaggregate and re-aggregate value. And you can deliver value to people in a way that perhaps you hadn't thought of before. I'm then going to suggest to you that in doing all of this, you can disrupt your marketplace and in the process, redefine that marketplace. And as Peter Thiel says, if you do this right, a monopoly is a condition of every successful business. A monopoly awaits you if you do it right. So really to start, I'm going to talk about me and my background. So a little case study for you. Hong Kong Visa Centre is, is my <coughs> business. And, and my background really is that I started an immigration practice in Hong Kong in 1993, straight out of law school. Uh, and uh, I built it up to become the leading business immigration practice in Hong Kong until 2000. And then between 2010, I made a whole load of stupid mistakes. Uh, and essentially, 2010, I was facing bankruptcy. In 2010, I then uh, recognized the errors of my way and started to do things differently. So in 2011, I launched a business in Hong Kong called the Hong Kong Visa Center. And the Hong Kong Visa Center essentially uh, provides a completely free of charge service to anybody in Hong Kong who has any kind of immigration problem. And this service encompasses the delivery of high quality content to the extent that I publish uh, content four to five times a week on my niche. And as a result of that, I'm able to create relationships. Uh, and as you'll see, the um, essential dynamic that exists in uh, my business to the extent that I can create a monopoly is that I help answer questions and help people solve problems. I also, in developing my business model, completely reverse the risk. What that means is that as a result of people using our websites and accessing all of our free resources. If they determine that they want to have my business assist them secure immigration status for them on a professional basis, if we take them on and we don't take every client on, we will give them a double your money back guarantee, which essentially completely reverses the risk in, uh, in the way that we do business, making it very easy for people who are minded to instruct a professional immigration advisor. Um, they would instruct us rather than somebody else because they've got, uh, they've got no risk associated with it. Moreover, we apply throughout our business both in terms of the dealings that we have with our clients, the dealings that we have with people that are interested in what we're doing, and all of our staff, the golden rule. It's a very simple policy in our business, and that's to treat other people like you yourself would hope to be treated. Um, in also uh, understanding your marketplace and delivering a proposition that is 
very different. When you, when you disaggregate and reaggregate value, you then start to understand exactly what it is that you're selling. And I know that in my game, after doing this for 24 years, that people are not paying for a visa label in a passport. They're not paying for the avoidance of queues at the immigration department. What they're really paying for is peace of mind, and that's what we sell. And our entire proposition is based on selling peace of mind. So let's just drill down on it in a little, uh, little more detail. Um, there was a gentleman called Caldini who wrote a book called The Secrets <coughs> of the Science of Persuasion. And he looked at the, the human condition and anticipated how we are as a species today and how we respond to certain circumstances. And we live in very complicated times. But when we were back in the savannah, we needed to um, cooperate with people so that we could ensure our survival. And out of this, hardwired into our DNA today, is this notion of the law of reciprocity. And that is, I do something for you, and you have this innate sense that you need to give something back to me. And the law of reciprocity and the connection economy that we live in today is the most powerful phenomenon that you can harness to progress your business affairs. And in, in, in giving away all of your IP in the way that we do and creating um, the relationships that we do with people, we generate incredible goodwill. When you are generating your goodwill using the internet in the way that we do, you essentially are able to create relationships. And those relationships, because of the use of social media today, are incredibly easy to generate. Um, it's not commonly understood that social media technology is actually a relationship enabling technology. If you think about social media and your use of any social media, and for that it's WordPress, it's Meetup, it's Twitter, it's LinkedIn, it's Facebook, it's all of these technologies that you use to be able to reach out to individuals. When you're using that technology, you're actually creating relationships with people. And you don't yourself perceive, when you receive a communication, you don't perceive that you're part of some greater audience. You believe that the party that is imparting their, um, their connection to you, they're looking to have a relationship with, they're looking to deal with you. So social media is actually a process to create relationships. It's a relationship enabler. And social media, as I say, are not part of an audience. People misunderstand how the internet works. Social media is different from broadcast media. Broadcast media was designed at a time when information and the means of communicating the information were necessarily forged together because nobody had access to, to a large audience except for those people who had the resources to generate that large audience. But with social media, it's completely different. We are not using social media to broadcast. We're using social media to reach out to individuals. And you win your relationships one at a time. And um, to that extent, what we do is, as I say, we answer people's questions and we help them solve their problems. So somebody comes onto our website, they've got a problem, they search around, they invariably find the answer that they need. If they've got additional, uh, they need additional assistance, they can reach out to us through our websites. They can ask us a question 48 hours later, we'll give them a podcast answer anonymously in, their, in, in terms of their information, uh, completely free of charge. And when you do something like that for somebody and you are the expert in your space, as I am for my sins in mine, the power of actually doing that for people is incredible. And as I say, social media enables you to do that. So um, social media is a process. It's not a way to communicate with people. It's the way you forge relationships. So you, when your relationships one at a time, you use your websites in order to share your know-how and your experience and your knowledge, and people become uh, reliant on that, uh, on that resource on the internet. And as you win those relationships with people that have got a genuine interest in what you're all about, one by one by one, they become part of what Seth Golding says is a tribe. And a tribe is a group of people connected to one another, connected to a leader, and connected to an idea. And for millions of years, we've been part of one tribe or another. And today in the connection economy, a, a group only needs two things to be a tribe. Tonight, we have a tribe. People have a shared interest, and you've got a way to communicate. So this is the, the third proposition that I've got for you as to how you go about building a monopoly in your niche. 
Fourthly, um, I read a book many, many years ago by Tom, Don Tapscott called The Digital Economy, and it opened my eyes completely. Because he explained to me what this modern life was really all about and what this technological thing was all about. And he also explained to me that, you know, in the connection economy, you can take information and you can take your product or service and you can separate them. And you can give all that information away. And if you understand what it is that you're selling, you can then sell a product that isn't deliverable via the information that you give and you're not holding anything back but what you've done is you've understood what it is that people really want from you and in our instance people want peace of mind and you can go on our websites you can use all our free resources we'll give you free answers we'll do everything for you but in the final analysis people pay us for this sense that we're going to say yes we can take care of you we will get your <coughs> visa approved and that's the peace of mind that they can't get anywhere else and this is how Don Tapscott advised me in terms of how we should uh, dis disaggregate and re-aggregate value and that's what we did and ultimately according to Don Tapscott every company will require a web-based business model to succeed so I can tell you from my experience if you don't have a the internet at the heart of what you do, you will not be successful over the long haul because somebody else will come along in your space and will do essentially what you're doing but in a different way and will basically take, steal your lunch. So um, desegregate and re-aggregate value. In the process, what you do is, as we've done in our niche, you change the landscape of how people expect in my instance, an immigration service to be. When I started this, I came from a twin, almost a 20-year pedigree in, in immigration, and I understand the market perfectly. And I understood that my main competitors in Hong Kong, who I was a co-founder of one in, in 2000 and, and spent two and a half years consulting to the other uh, between 2006 and 2009, I understood that when they were delivering their proposition, they were doing exactly the same thing that I was doing in 1993. So it seems to me that you can come in and just do things differently. And people say that on the internet, everything should be, information wants to be free. Stuart Brand said information wants to be free. So my proposition is, if information is going to be free, you may as well own free. And that's what we've done. So by owning free, we've essentially taken out of the marketplace all the dynamics that have served the industry per se all of these years and served them so well and changed the landscape completely. So now when people are, in, are experiencing anything to do with Hong Kong immigration that come to our websites, they expect that that is the proposition. Because immigration is one of those things that you only need to do it once occasionally in your life. And, and it's not as though you completely understand how an immigration service is, 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 is generally provided. So if you find your way onto our websites and, and see what we're doing and understand what it's all about, your mind is changed forever. Unless you're one of these people that's just interested in getting the cheapest price possible. And there are, there's a segment in the marketplace for those people who want the cheapest price possible. And that's fine. It's not the market that we want, but for the bulk of the market, we're able to we define what we believe is the marketplace and at the same time lock our competitors out because of what we've done. So as I say, why play somebody else's game when you can reinvent a marketplace? And that's what we did. And how do you reinvent your marketplace? Firstly, you have to know your market backwards. I've been doing this for 24 years. I know everything about this market. I, I was to say I was a co-founder of, of one of my main competitors and I spent two and a half years for working for, as a consultant for the main competitor. I know exactly what they're all about, so it's easy for me to think about how I could do things differently. Secondly, know your customer. I've been doing this for so long. I know exactly what's happening between the ears of our clients. I know what they feel like. I know what their emotional responses are to, to the experience that they have every step of the way. And because I understand that, our proposition is designed to address all of those fears, to make those fears go away, to make the customer as, as, as confident in, in what's going on as we can possibly make him. So you have to know your customer. Moreover, as I mentioned, you have to know your competition because if you know your competition, you can construct your proposition and do things incredibly different from them. So if you do that, as we've experienced, uh, a monopoly awaits. Peter Thiel wrote this book 
um, published about 18 months or so ago, based on the Stanford talk that he gave, I think about four years ago. And I, um, I, I came across the Stanford talk about two years ago. And it was the first time that I'd heard somebody really in the know. And Peter Thiel was a co-founder of PayPal. He's one of Silicon Valley's uh, most preeminent um, venture capitalists. Someone in the, really in the know came up with this <coughs> idea that, that every successful business, the natural condition, is a monopoly because if you do it right, you do it against your competition. They um, they uh, they can't compete against you. So you by doing this, as we've done, you own a, a market that's entirely of your own making. And this business model that we've adopted, and you can think about this for your business too, it completely reverses the risk. Over time, if you publish like we do, you create huge barriers to entry, and it makes it very very difficult for your competition to respond and the thing about having monopoly in the connection economy that we've got today is that you re-earn the privilege of your monopoly every day so you can be generous and forthright and do everything that you want to do in terms of having relationships with people but your reputation is this far away from disaster in the connection economy so you have to re-earn your privilege to your monopoly every single day and that keeps you incredibly honest um, and as you, as we're doing, move through this process and you put yourself into a situation where you're redefining your market and your, competi your competition's falling away and you're growing and we've grown 270% in the last 12 months. Uh, we started from nothing four years ago and did more than a million and a half US dollars last year. Um, essentially you're able to move into aligned areas that just present themselves. For example, in our instance, we've only ever done Hong Kong immigration. As a result of doing Hong Kong immigration, we've forged a lot of relationships with international immigration businesses that, that want us to take care of their client needs in Hong Kong because they don't have any kind of operation here. And forging those relationships, opportunities emerged naturally without needing to worry about it to provide what's known as consular visa services. So if an Indian national who's a resident of Hong Kong that wants to go to Japan, he needs a visa for Japan. So we never have thought about getting visas for Japan for Indians who live in Hong Kong. But naturally these revenue opportunities presented themselves and because immigration is immigration is immigration, it's just that the processes slightly change and the forms are different uh, and the timelines can uh, can, 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 can change um, it's it's very easy to go from from Hong Kong immigration into this logical adjacency of, uh, of um, uh, consular visa work that we do and as a result of that your growth is completely assured it's a market that completely is ahead of you so in my proposition my proposition is that generosity is a winning business model and you can build a monopoly position in your market space by giving as we do everything away for free so